Ponderosa Pete, written by Julie Blake Gidley, illustrations by Scott Sink. It was a summer day in northern Arizona. Sunlight poured onto the branches of the ponderosa pine trees warm in the back of a young tassel-eared squirrel named Birdie. Her strong legs propelled her from branch to branch. She was searching for fresh pine twigs to eat and felt lucky to live in such a large forest with so many tall trees. Birdie stopped to catch her breath and look over the ocean of trees all around her. She noticed one very large pine tree nearby. It was growing on a rocky ledge and towered above the other trees. Birdie thought it must be very old. Birdie scampered along the branch she was standing on and leapt through the trees until she finally landed on the big tree. His trunk seemed to reach clear up to the blue sky. Bertie pressed her nose against the tree's yellow bark and took a deep breath. The tree smelled like sweet vanilla. This tree smells wonderful, Bertie exclaimed aloud. Why, thank you, responded a mysterious voice. Bertie gasped in fright and looked around to see where the voice was coming from. Do not be afraid, said the grandfatherly voice, seemed to be coming from the great tree's trunk. I am Ponderosa Pete. Ponderosa Pete, Bertie hesitantly repeated. Yes, I have been living on this mountain for more than 300 years, which makes me very old, even for a pine tree. That is a long time, said Bertie. I'm only one year old. It is a long time, Ponderosa Pete sighed. During this time, my home has changed so much. Would you like to hear the story of this forest? Oh, yes, I would like that very much, replied Bertie. I was born in 1676, 100 years before the United States was even a country. The forest back then was a very different place than you see today. It was spacious with small clumps of beautiful pine trees all around. Many different forest animals lived there. The trees, grasses, and shrubs all shared the bright sunlight. Biodiversity in this forest was very high, but it was also a very difficult environment to grow up in as a young sapling. Why was it so hard? Bertie asked. During summer storms, lightning would strike trees and start small surface fires that often burned across the forest floor, replied the old tree. These fires occurred every two to twelve years and burned up dead pine needles, grasses, flowers, small shrubs, and young trees like me. The tall, strong pine tree easily survived surface fires because they had extra thick bark to protect them. Many young trees were born in the forest every year, but only a few survived these fires. That's terrible, Bertie cried. Not really, said Ponderosa Pete. I was one of the survivors, and over the years I realized how important fires are in Ponderosa Pine forest ecosystems. After a fire, many different kinds of understory plants grow back, as well as the truffles you'd like to eat. The forest isn't just trees, you know. Forest animals such as elk, deer, and squirrels like you come up from all around to eat the fresh, tasty plants. Native Americans understood that many good things happened because of these fires. They began setting their own surface fires, too. 
These fires kept the forest from getting too crowded and made it easier to hunt animals. Fire adapted plants thrived after the frequent fires which helped the people collect fresh plants for making food, medicine, and baskets. Life in the Ponderosa Pine Forest continued this way for the first 200 years of my life until suddenly everything began to change. What happened? Bernie asked. First, European American settlers moved into our forest from far away, said the tree. Loggers cut many of the large trees because they needed them to build railroads and houses for growing towns. I was lucky to avoid being cut down. This time I survived because I was growing on the steep mountainside where it was difficult for loggers to reach me. But that was only the first change. Instead of letting natural fires burn, settlers put them out because they were afraid that their new buildings would burn down. They also brought cattle and sheep into our forest. Some areas, so many cattle and sheep grazed that they ate most of the grasses, shrubs, and other plants and didn't leave any food for the native animals. Without all these understory plants, surface fires could no longer burn. Forests started to become crowded with small trees. But couldn't the small trees grow into big ones? asked the squirrel. Not easily, said Ponderosa Pete. Most people didn't understand what all these changes would do to our forest home. But now it was become obvious there are far too many trees. Without surface fires to clear out most of the young ones, it is hard for me to get the food and water I need to be healthy. I now have to compete with many more trees and none of us are as healthy as we should be. I'm one of the lucky ones because I'm so big and tall. My roots reach farther down in the soil than those of the smaller trees, so I can still get the water and nutrients I need to survive. My branches spread out farther than the small trees' branches so I can still reach sunlight with my needles. What about the small trees, Bertie asked. I feel sorry for them, replied the tree, and you can't reach the things they need to be healthy. You're very sick. Some of them are so skinny and weak they can't even stand up straight. This forest has become a lonely place for me. Most of my understory plant friends are gone because they were starving for food and water. Many of my animal friends, like deer and rabbit, can't visit anymore because there are no plants left for them to eat. It's too shady under all those small trees. The hawks can't fly and hunt in such dense forests, and even the butterflies don't visit because there are no flowers for them. The forest has lost the rich biodiversity it once had. But I'm visiting you, reminded Bertie. Yes, and I'm very happy you're here. But most forest animals don't rely on ponderosa pine trees for food like you do. Can things get better again? Bertie asked the big tree. Yes. I think there's hope, Pete replied. But I'm worried because the surface fires that used to keep our forest healthy are growing into dangerous crown fires, continued Pete. These new fires climb into the tops of big trees and burn everything in the forest, not just understory plants and small trees. How terrible, Bertie exclaimed. It is, Pete agreed. Crown fires can burn down houses and even whole towns because they move so quickly. Very difficult for firefighters to control. It scares me to think that my forest home and everything in it might burn up. Ponderosa pine trees can take hundreds or thousands of years to recover from crown fires. Luckily, some people are trying to fix what has happened. They call it forest restoration. They believe that the best way for forests to get healthy again 
is to cut down many of the skinny, sick trees to leave more room for the remaining trees. And the fire fires light prescribed fires on purpose, just like the surface fires Native Americans use to recycle nutrients back into the soil and make room for new plants to grow. They hope that this will help restore the forest to how it was when I was growing up. I hope so too, Pipe Birdie. As forest health improves, continued Pete, scientists believe the number of animals in Ponderosa pine forests will also increase. Old dead trees called snags can even help by providing perching sites for hawks and homes for insects, bats, birds, and squirrels. Wow, sighed Bertie. I wish the people would hurry up and restore all of our forests. Well, it's not really that easy, Bertie. Forest restoration is complicated and not easy for people to do. Pete mourned. Since people are not as old as I am, no one can remember what a healthy ponderosa pine forest used to look like. They have to use other ways to figure out what a healthy forest should be like. Sometimes they compare today's forest to old sketches and photographs that were taken before the forest started to change. I've also heard them talk about ponderosa pine trees at the Grand Canyon. They're so isolated that people were never able to cut the trees down or extinguish fires there. So these forests basically look the same as they did hundreds of years ago. People today can visit those special places to find out how the plants and animals in Ponderosa Pine Forest should look and act. It makes me happy to see people working together to restore forest health, said Pete. It makes me happy too, Bertie chimed in. If they succeed, the tree continued patiently they can protect the forest and their communities from dangerous crown fires. It's no easy task, but it is very important. Humans, plants, animals, and big trees like me all depend on a healthy forest to survive now and for future generations. And squirrels like me, Bertie asked. Yes, squirrels too, said Pete. Wow, the forest looks so different now that I know it's history, exclaimed Bertie. Yes, it is important that young squirrels like you and people everywhere understand this history, said the old tree, because once we see the whole picture, we can work together to help fix past mistakes and build a brighter future.